All right, let's continue talking about attitudes, but this time let's focus on how attitudes are formed. By far, our strongest, most influential attitudes are learned via direct experience with some attitudinal object. And when we form our attitudes based on direct experience, they tend to be better thought out. They tend to be more stable. They're also more resistant to attack. You know, people are often trying to change our attitudes via various persuasive attempts. And attitudes that are learned via direct experience also tend to be more predictive of actual behaviors. So one really good example includes people's religious attitudes. Most people's religious attitudes simply mirror the attitudes of their parents. But people who have formed religious attitudes based on their own direct experiences, they tend to have better thought out attitudes regarding religion. They tend to be more stable. And those attitudes tend to be more predictive of religious behaviors, such as attending church services. Attitudes are also learned via our social environment, our social circles. And that, of course, includes our parents, our friends, and just basically our, our culture and the, the society that we live in. Our parents, of course, are extremely influential. In fact, one of the best predictors of a person's attitude is simply knowing their parents' attitude on that same issue, whether it's religion or politics or how to handle money or some other big important issue. So when it comes to parents and when it comes to friends, we learn attitudes by observing them and by talking to them, but we also learn our attitudes from them based on how we are rewarded and punished by them. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's say that as a kid, you might have thought that religion was kind of silly and that church was no fun. But when you shared those attitudes with your mom, she might have been horrified by your lack of faith and angry that you were challenging this important family tradition. But then later, you know, maybe you started showing an interest in your church's youth group. And then you can see she was beaming with pride and telling you how much she loved you. So to a large extent, our attitudes are learned based on how we've been conditioned by our parents and our friends because they reward us and they punish us based on our specific attitudes. Whenever we talk about rewards and punishments, what we're really dealing with is called associative learning. We are associating rewards and associating punishments with our attitudes or with our behaviors. And of course, attitudes and behaviors that are rewarded are more likely to be strengthened. We're more likely to either engage in those behaviors in the future or more likely to express and adopt those attitudes in the future. So rewards and punishments are obviously very important. A related concept is known as evaluative conditioning. In this situation, as people and products and ideas become associated with attractive things, then our attitudes for those people, for those products, for those ideas become more positive. I mean, in general, that's just marketing 101. Let me give you a couple examples. So as you know, it's not uncommon to see beautiful models associated with cars and other products. And if we see her in a positive way, the whole idea is we're more likely to see the car in a positive way. Now that association doesn't always have to be so superficial, just simply based on beauty. So for example, although Carrie Jennings Walsh is a beautiful woman, she's also a very accomplished volleyball player. So a company like Wilson might want to use her uh, to sell their volleyballs. Now that seems reasonable too, that you might have a better view of Wilson volleyballs because they're being endorsed by Carrie Jennings Walsh. You'd think that she has some inside information. I mean, she's a, she's a professional athlete in this sport, but it doesn't stop there. So. Carrie Jennings Walsh is also a spokesperson for The Honest Company. And, and here's really where we get the key point. I don't really care about that detergent that she's using. It's a previously neutral stimulus. I had no positive view, no negative view of it. But if I really like Carrie Jennings Walsh and I see that she's using that product, now I'm more likely to have a positive view of that product. That's what evaluative conditioning is all about. When I say that our attitudes are learned via our social environment, it's important not to forget the factors of our culture and our society and how much of an impact they have. So, for example, I think about over the years how our relationship with Russia has changed so much. When I was very young, uh, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis and the United States government was definitely at odds with Russia. And growing up, most people in American society feared Russia. We feared that we were gonna to go to war with Russia. 
But then everything changed in the 80s. When Ronald Reagan came along, he got along really well with the leaders of Russia, and we had this awakening, and now we were more seen as friends. The Cold War was over. My point is simply that as our society changes, as our culture changes, as our government has a different type of relationship with the Russian government, that's going to very much influence my attitudes. That's going to very much influence your attitudes and the other people within our society. Now, of course, that continues to change. So we saw more recently the Obama administration had a very strained relationship with Russia. But we're hearing that the next president uh, wants to really open things up with Russia. So yet again, our own individual attitudes in our society are likely to change as a result. All right, so we've talked about how our attitudes can be learned from direct experience and from our family, from our friends, from our social circles. But we need to keep this in mind as well. Our attitudes, to some extent, can have a genetic basis. Sometimes that's hard for people to understand. Keep this basic point in mind. Our thoughts occur in our brains, and our brains are just biological organs that we have inherited from our parents, from our other ancestors. So look at this comic. That might help you put it in perspective as well. Here it shows a dad, and he's got a big fat butt, and it shows his son, and he also has a big fat butt. And it says, thanks for almost everything, Dad. And we know that that son shares genetics with the dad. And essentially, the dad passed down part of his body to his son. So it makes sense to us that the dad and the son might have some similar traits. The exact same thing is going on with the brain. Remember, that son has a brain that was passed down from his dad and from his mom. So shouldn't we expect that the way that the son thinks is at least partially going to be influenced by how the mom and the dad think? Well, that all sounds reasonable, but we need to see if there's some research to back it up. And one way to really get a sense of what's going on genetically is to start looking at some twins. So let's talk a little bit about twins research. These twins right here are identical. And if they're identical, that means that they're essentially genetic clones. These twins right there, although they look a lot alike, they are fraternal twins. They are not genetic clones. They are just as genetically similar as any other brothers and sisters. It just so happens that those two brothers right there were born at exactly the same time. So the thing that makes this nice for research purposes is we've got two groups of kids who were born at the same time, and then they were raised in, in the same families. So they were treated in essentially the same way, and they had essentially the same types of experiences. Well, here's what's interesting. The identical twins tend to have more similar attitudes than the fraternal twins. In other words, there's more correspondence in the attitudes of the identical twins compared to the fraternal twins. And keep in mind, how do they really differ, these two sets of twins? These two have the same genetics. So you see, it provides some evidence that there's a genetic link with our attitudes. So we really need to warm up to the basic idea that we might hold certain attitudes because of the unique physical and mental traits that we were born with. So keep in mind too, like our temperament and our personalities, those are at least partially based on our biology. And both of those factors are likely to influence our styles of thinking and our attitudes. The twins' research that I just described is fascinating, but what I'm about to tell you is probably even more fascinating. Not all twins are raised together, and that's because, of course, sometimes things happen and homes get broken. So here's a picture right here of two identical twins, but they were actually raised in separate homes. They were adopted out to separate homes, and they grew up not knowing each other. Well, later on, of course, they often come to know each other, and researchers are often very interested in them. And here's what's really interesting. The correspondence in attitudes with the identical twins who are raised together is similar to the correspondence in attitudes between the identical twins who are raised apart. In other words, the genetic component is so strong, there wasn't even some added effect of growing up in the same household. So this pattern of evidence suggests that people are predisposed, you know, based on their genetics at birth, to hold certain attitudes. All right, my friends, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.